Welcome to another edition of the Leaf Noise Up Show, at which point I give these guys a chance to rant on whatever bothers them this week. And uh, the topics that are likely to come up are um, Gordon Brown's emergence from his world tour, or wherever he's been, been for the last two years, and deciding to support the Yes campaign. Was that a good idea or not? Um, the experts all agreeing apparently within the last couple of days that yes, Scotland could negotiate its way into the EU or not out of it or whatever happened if there was a, a yes vote. Um, and BBC debate, the used out Scotland BBC debate the other night, which um, was all about people, not Scottish people, but people out with Scotland who settled here in the studio, which was very interesting. And a little bit of perhaps comparative NHS north and south of the border. We've all got a bit of experience with that. A little bit of that. <laughs> How would you like to start? Let's go with uh, Brown. Uh, as a, a loyal Labour Party member and a, a devotee of uh, Mr Gordon Brown, how are you doing? Devotee, not uh, at all, Gordon Brown. Um, well, I should imagine if they really, really want it, they the mainstream in the Labour Party, or a lot of them, or uh, well, those at the top, seem to think that Gordon Brown will be great because uh, the votes will go up when Gordon Brown comes in. Um, and everybody thinks Gordon Brown was great and Gordon Brown saved the world. Um, no doubt, when the crash happened, um, the only person who was focused um, in actually pumping money into the system to save the system from collapsing was Brown. And, well, and, sorry, can, and I, can I just point out that he was largely... Responsible uh, for uh, uh, the yeah. system collapsing in the first place by the yeah, light yeah, touch yeah. regulation. Yeah, yeah, but you stopped me before I said that. Okay. But the, the system was collapsed in Gordon Light Touch. Sounds like some kind of chief from some North American. But I thought, right, I thought, I thought Gordon, we, Gordon Light, thought, Light, Light Touch and his belt, I thought, I thought they we, didn't regulate the system. I thought we all agreed now that that's actually, in actual fact, by saving the bankers instead of locking them up, that was the biggest mistake that could have done. Yeah. Well, and they should have allowed that, a run in the banks after, after a week, start locking up the bankers. Yeah, and, and what they should be doing is, is sequestering and taking back all their bonuses and all these things that they've actually fraudulently got, fraudulently on, on quite, a, uh, quite a, a few, well, all the time, I should imagine. I mean, the whole thing was just a, mil a, a milk from the minute it was the big bang, actually. It was Maggie that started right. that. All right. Alex, Brown. Um... <clears throat> Yeah, I'm a bit skitsoid about my observations about Brown. Mm. Uh, not that I disagree for a moment with anything that Phil has just, just said. Um, however, we mustn't ever forget that after that debacle, even when he was getting hammered in England, he, his, he was very successful in Scotland in the 2010 election. Yeah. I agree with you. Because he was one of their own, there's no doubt about that. And, then, and given that the Labour constituency is, is the balancing wherewithal from whence we have to get the votes for independence, uh, you, you're a good person to ask this question up to a point, although you viscerally dislike the guy. But I mean, I'm an ex Labour supporter as well. But I, what I don't know is what the Labour supporters out in the street think. I would imagine lots of them are quite happy for him to turn up. However, if he's going to turn up and contradict the pathetic statements that Lamont's made about, as a number of the unions have made, about increased devolution in the, in the event of a no vote, and come up with this obfuscation about fiscal equalisation, which any half-decent interpreter, and sadly, very sadly, Mr. Ponsonby, for whom I have a lot of time, basically tugged his forelock and let Gordon Brown away with murder in that interview. If, he, if he'd done to him what I know he's capable of, he would have made him look foolish. And what about this Better Together campaign? I mean, Gordon Brown's his speech more or less launched um, United with Labour or for Labour, yeah, yeah. a separate campaign. It's yeah. for those from people that wouldn't together. stand anywhere near a Liberal yeah. oratorium. So or, I mean, if or in his instance, anywhere near Alistair Darling, because there's no yeah. way he'd stand on a platform next to him, never mind the Tories. OK, but bear in mind <laughs> that when it comes to the EU and Tory party splits in the last 30 years, the voters have demolished every party, every, the Tories, every time they've clearly been divided. If the unionist, the pro-unionist campaign is this divided, it's going to damage it, surely. Well, it might. It depends what they say, Stuart. I'm not so sure about that because 
they yes, they have to try and avoid being toxified by stood on a, being stood on a platform next next to the Tories. Although Alistair Darling, I think, is more than capable of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, if they mounted a complementary campaign, and it meant that they could get Labour voters to go out on the street for them to support it then it could have some merit. The question is, what are they going to say? And what Gordon Brown has said so far, if he keeps saying what he's saying, he'll leave, he'll leave that, that campaign open to lots of attack because it's painfully obvious that Brown is, isn't even capable of the obfuscation that Lamont is capable of because she's sitting here all the time and she goes on about, oh, well, we're thinking about it, we're considering it, I've got a commission judging it. He says, uh, they might have a commission judging it, but I'm totally against it. <laughs> so it's painfully obvious he does not want to do anything uh, positive in the context of a novel. Well, let's move on. Um, this last couple of days has been confirmation by experts that, um, and even apparently James, was it Crawford? James Anderson? Anyway, the uh, oh, advisor oh, to the oh, UK oh, government on, Crawford, said. on, uh, on uh, how long it would take um, this, uh, for an independent Scotland to negotiate its way to a satisfactory position, I think it was most of it about Europe, but it was also a general issue uh, that Scotland could be independent in 18 months, yeah. with all treaties and things. Yeah. Um, even the former, uh, no, the former Taoiseach, the former Prime Minister of Ireland, Mr. Brunton, mm -hmm. was quoted as saying it was possible. I'm not going to go through the list. Did you, you, you follow this topic? Uh, yeah, I follow it very closely. And interestingly enough, I had some statistics quoted during the week which were quite illuminating, suggesting that the, deg that the typical degree of Euroscepticism in Britain, or more particularly in England, is actually not atypical across Europe. Lots of other countries have a similar hesitancy about Europe. But when it comes to it, um, I have to say, as somebody who's lived in England for nearly 40 years, there's a degree of Little England xenophobia about Europe that goes way beyond oh. anything that's experienced up here. It's, it's hard to explain. So I blame think, Europe instead of blaming the, 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 the Westminster government. Well, you see, we're actually responsible but it's, for it's classic when you, all these foreigners. when you get into the do-do, blame the foreigners. You always blame, blame the, that group. Now, the, the issue here is the more you keep uh, latch on to that and the more Na nasty stuff comes out, one has to believe that contrary to Barroso, who could have kept his trap shut and been far more politic, actually giving the Unionists ammunition, you're going to hear more people like Brunton coming out and saying, well, actually, yes, there's technically a negotiation. Yes, there's technically, a, a, because it would be a new country, literally, but the fact is, it's a slam dunk, and you, mm. you're going to get them saying that because they don't like what's being said in Westminster. Well, the, the, the thing is with the galleys, when you're looking at the galleys, you've got Barroso and all that, and they're all their little pals around, they all have their own agenda somewhere else. Um, and you should just dismiss these people because that's all they're really worth. The vast majority of the others would be sitting there wondering why they're going on in, in foreign ministers of different countries and prime ministers of different countries. And, well, like you said, it's a slam dunk. It's, it's called being reasonable. There's a case of reasonableness. Yeah. We're already a member of the European Union. Mm -hmm. We're also a component part of the United Kingdom. Is a we're also in the currency union. Yeah, we're also yeah. in the currency union. Actually, I think we had a pound anyway before it because we, I think we set up, the, the Scotland, Scots set up the Bank of England. Well, in the that's first another place. story. I'll it's it's right another one. Name. But the whole point Mr. is, Patterson. it's sensible. Um, and Europe, will, if you took that attitude, oh no, you can't come in, you'll have to do this, you'll have to jump up and do somersaults. No, it will just be a matter of, um, as it had been said, you will, you will negotiate from within because yep. they're already there. The, the, just as one final comment on this, I think uh, this is a, an example, in my opinion, of something that can be built on about negotiation. You see, there was a question asked today about, well, have you asked, have you, Westminster are the only ones who can, can, can ask Europe about the detail. And in refusing to ask it, their only defence is, well, we're not going to do anything in any way can makes any concession to the possibility of independence. Now, there, there will be increasingly a point where that intransigence works against them because, you know, you get, you've had the questions before, is the Ministry of Defence mm. drawing up contingency planning? It, all of these all these people should be drawing up contingency planning because if they're not, they will appear to be stupid. Whether they're going to be one or not. Incompetent, exactly. Can I just finish on yeah. one? Right. For those that say, 
or, or try to cloud the issue about Scotland being a member of the European Union, you're either a fudmonger or you're a complete moron. OK, we'll take it at that. Um, NHS, um, north and south of the border, all three of us have quite clearly oh. got uh, com you know, contemporary experience. Um, I have to say, the short story was I fell and broke a rib last, last year. I managed to get myself home just in absolute agony, wedged myself in a chair. What do I do? Phone the GP surgery. Uh, no, I actually phoned NHS director or something. What do I do? Oh, phone, your GP. phone the GP surgery. And within an hour and a half, there's somebody out from my own DG, local GP to come and see me. There's no way I could make my way in. You know, and yet I didn't, I didn't really need an ambulance. So that was, uh, that, that was, I was well impressed by that. It was my GP, it wasn't a local. Um, when I do go to England, uh, I never have any problems down there. I have walked into a, uh, a completely stranger's strange uh, surgery with uh, a severe chest infection, explained to the reception what I had and walked out 20 minutes later with the prescription I needed. There doesn't seem to be a problem at the moment and yet they're both completely separate systems. We, what we are aware about <coughs> is the, private, the, the, the privatisation side of the world. I bet if we were if we were independent, they'd have shot you and put you back on the street. Oh, allegedly. Allegedly. Um, yeah, I don't. Uh, it's an, an interesting question. I think the whole issue about the increased demand on uh, on A and E, and uh, it would appear to be to a great extent as a consequence of the renegotiation of the of the GP contract. Uh, Is I, this in England or in Scotland? Well, it's both. I mean, if you in fact they were they were quoting it in England as well this week that we've got this. Pro in fact, I think almost to make it so. We've had, dub we've had a doubling of the demand at uh, A&E in England. Oh, by the way, in Scotland, it's a trebling. Because if you remember last week on FMQs, that point was made by Jackie Bailey. So I don't know what the facts are about that. But, the, but there appears to be, both north and south of the border, a consequence of various things, ageing population. But the thing that seems to be getting, getting the most blame for it is the renegotiated GP's contract. And I have to say, I, I haven't... I go to the GP here... Um, it's just not a problem. I make an appointment. I've never, had to, I've never been stuck and not been able to get an appointment reasonably quickly. So, if you have to phone the GP here, I have heard several comments this morning saying, "Well, if you have to phone them and get them out, somebody will come out, so it's not an issue." It, it appears to be increasingly difficult in England to the extent that people are going to A and E instead. I don't know the facts of it, but that, that's what it looks like. And I, I certainly know twenty years ago in England. I had a doctor, a named doctor, I could phone up and get an appointment mm -hmm. with that named doctor quickly. That moved from, well, you can maybe, if you're willing to wait, you can maybe get the named doctor, otherwise you've got to go to one of the other GPs. Well, you do that, no bother. They used to come out of the weekend, they stopped coming out of the weekend. And it, it's definitely not as user-friendly customer service <coughs> that we used to have. So, All right. You, I mean, you, you, you still got family down south, you go to London regularly. Yeah, I've had horror stories from friends, and uh, I mean, just two years ago, my sister-in-law, um, just again, she, uh, her GP had noticed she had this persistent cough, so, and he wasn't, and it took over three months um, to actually get her an appointment to find out what it was. It was a matter of, well, she'd got appointments, but then they got there, and because um, they had... You're talking about getting to a consultant? Yeah, getting to a consultant and getting a scan, um, and getting to a consultant. Right. Um, but you'd get along there, and somebody's taking the appointment, but it's not in that book. Incompetence, because you have all these different health boards, which is the internal market, or infernal market, down there, which is done. Um, as it was anyway, she was dead nine months later, in it because it had spread by the time she'd got cancer. Um, and other ones. But you see, you always remember the bad ones. Um, and here, up here, and down there, the vast majority of people will get surprised. Right? You'll always, you know, shit happens. Um, mm -hmm. In, in that type of thing, which is what went on in today when you talk about that woman in First Minister's Question Times mm -hmm. that had cancer. Things happen. But there was a quote there, which Joanne Lamont said about, that there'll be people here streaming down south. Oh. Now, health, we still have... Health, health refugees. Well, like first that. thing that Nicola Sturgeon did, you know, because <coughs> we were, Labour Party was going along with this. They started this whole privatisation with the polyclinics and everything down there. <laughs> the PPI. Um, well, it's, it's the obsession yeah, that, that Blair, yeah, and, and particularly Brown, still has. He has an obsession with turning us into the 51st state. I mean, he should move from Fife and bugger off to America. Because <laughs> um, he's, you know, with, with his fixation with money. And 
There's foundation hospitals there that are going under. Um, the whole way that they're configuring it, they'll have United Health, you'll have Virgin, and huge American multinationals will be coming in there. And before they started all this privatization thing, there was about 4% of NHS money was spent on administration. In America, it's about 25%. It goes into lawyers and consultants, all that. It just goes in, doesn't go into health. And you're up, you'll just end up with people flooding up here. Because I can bet within a decade, if we get the Tories in again, people down there will be told, because of the constraints, because a quarter of the money that goes into the NHS will be going into non-medical yeah. services. And, of course, the problems. So that'll need, to, that'll, need to, that'll need to come out of insurance. So people down there will need to get insurance. Um, so then we'll be getting refugees up here. Well, you're, you're already getting them. Yeah. I think anecdotally, it's fairly obvious that a lot of people who retire in England see that Scotland is a much better place from a health perspective yeah. because of the... Guarantees. Yeah. Well, the healthcare they need because it's so healthy. No, no, no. If I broke a leg, well, I broke my, my, my wrist a um, couple of years ago. Um, there was a few bits they messed up, but other than that, the wrist, the wrist works and all the rest of it. I've done that in America, what, 15, 20,000? No, it's 30 odd thousand pounds if you break your leg. Right. That's roughly what it costs you. Okay, move on to um, this BBC debate the other night, which I managed to see. I watched it in, as a recording. It was uh, an hour long debate, I believe. They had an audience, it was at uh, Pacific Quay, the Governor General's mansion on the Clyde, and... Um, not, it, not owned by the BBC, by the way. Oh, it's owned the by building. private contractors as yeah, well. Yeah. Um, but certainly the, the audience was comprised of um, non-Scots, people who come to settle in Scotland, and largely English voices, but uh, also a, a, a few other ones. The panel, apart from Hamza Yusuf, but he was, after all, he looked a bit Pakistani or Indian or whatever he is. Oh, he's Pakistani. Um, he's Pakistani. Yeah. Okay. Pakistani. He's Scottish. He's Scottish. He's Scottish. The other Scottish three, Pakistani. the other three on the panel were all. Uh, I think they were, they were all English. Uh, Charles Booth was English from Lincolnshire. Gordon Banks is from somewhere in England, and also the Katie, Katie Grant. Grant. Yeah. Um, is she English? I can never tell. Her. Yeah. So, so she's obviously an English. Did you Did you Scottish. see this debate? English. I well, right. I, I've got an interesting anecdote in this debate because. I forgot about it and I missed the absolute opening gambit on it. So I switched on and there was somebody in the audience. Um, no, I think I switched on and I had the, the Labour uh, guy speaking. Then uh, your man went to the audience and asked two or three people and they were all English and I'm going, what's this? It's a conspiracy. Uh, although I, I, even at that point I was definitely schizoic. So I thought, well, it's an interesting conspiracy that's backfired because every English person I hear, apart from the Labour MP, is actually absolutely 100% solidly pro-independence. Uh, and then I gradually worked out, uh, although I, there was, the only dissenting voice in the audience was a jock. It was a Scotsman, so they weren't all English, so I don't know who this guy was, but he was Scottish. Every other voice was English, and the one Scotsman started, nyeh, 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 we can't do it. But everybody else was positive, and on the panel, Katie Grant is always like this. I don't know whether she's English or Scottish, but she's totally anti-independence, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, the Labour guy didn't impress very much. The guy who impressed me most was Charles Booth. Was Charles Booth. He was just, you, you wouldn't want a green. better, better... This is our Charles Booth. Yeah, yeah. Green, green councillor. Green Absolutely. Green. You wouldn't want a better poster boy for the Yes campaign. I mean, he's not SNP, he's not Scottish, but he's absolutely pro the whole thing. And it, it was great. And I'll bet you... Pro the Republican BBC, as well. The, exactly. The, I'll bet you the BBC management were totally pissed off because it was such a positive discussion. In the, in the end, the, sum, I, the summary was that uh, yes, it was a, a, it was a balanced argument, the, the, the questions came from the audience, they're all, the questions all came from the audience, and then the, and also the audience were, were, were allowed to, yeah. to comment after the panel had commented, it was a good debate, and as you say, the overwhelming consensus was pro-independence, yeah. but you didn't see it. Uh, well, I haven't seen it, but what I picked up from there, I mean, and, and, and a few things which you were saying about the English voices, I don't have any problem with that. I've been up here over 41 years from London. There's only one good thing to come out of London, it's called the A1, um, and it ends up at least four. Yeah, I don't have a, just to make this clear, no, I, don't, I, I don't have a problem with the English voices, but I, all I could hear was English voices, so I thought, what's yeah, going but see, on? If you haven't got the English voices up here living, and they're living up here for a reason, because they yeah. like it. Now, I see with people in the Labour Party, they, they, I mean, the vociferously unionists, um, Scots, Scots and Scots, yeah, uh, the ones that are sitting, I don't know where she got from, the ones that are England. sitting, look, I guess, are... are I mean, people from south of the border and, and other parts of Europe that have come here and they like Scotland and they, and they like the idea of it. Um, 
floating off on its own. It's just that the, there's just so many Scots actually suffer from the, the Stockholm syndrome. Yeah, you know I mean? they, 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 they really do. They just it, identify. But when it comes to English voices, I mean, I've said this many times. Maybe it's just because I spent lived for twenty odd years down in the south of England, and you know. And, so we've all got a lot, a lot, a lot of cross-border experience. Yeah. I've said it many times, usually in, in Leith, you only, you only sort of realise that your, your buddy, your friend is English when they wander off to a pub to watch an English football match. And then you realise, or, or a minor league one, you know, all oh, right, that's why you, you, you can you forget. Uh, good Scottish care. expression, we're all Jock Townsend's Benz, we're right? We're all God's children. And we're all, by the way, Europeans. Apart from the xenophobic people down south, you kippers, or yeah, the U you kippers, the Tories, guys. and a good chunk of the Labour Party, by the way. Okay, yeah. now let's finish. A highlight of the week. Any, do you need, to, or should we just wind up here? I would say Gordon Brun was my highlight of the week. You know, double double speak. I mean, he he doesn't do a train crash the way uh, Lamont does. But by God, he, he can speak for five minutes and you think, what the hell was that about? Somebody, somebody tweeted that, that his minder, his spad, must have been off camera and going like this every five minutes, you know, to make Tom smile, because he, apparently he was still, what do they call that way he smiles? Rick, 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 Rick. He did smile. I think somebody was doing that because he would occasionally go like that. <laughs> and everybody would jump in the audience. Um, yeah. I'd seen a bit of that with Gordon Brown, but... You are right, mate? Well, to a certain extent, yeah, yeah the, the highlight is the stupidity of bringing Gordon Brown into it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, those people in the Labour Party love him, but yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, he's going to put a lot of people off. Well, there they go. That, that, that's possibly true, but it is. Because he'll want to run everything. There's two big constituencies that the S campaign have to, uh, to turn, mm -hmm. and uh, one of them is Labour vote, normal Labour voters, yeah. and the other constituency is women. So, <sighs> and according to Simon Pierre, because he was on the previous night, he said women love him. Simon Pierre. Yeah. He he's, does. His opinions don't count. He's just a, a Labour Party spy. Yeah, I know he is. But let me tell you, oh, he said he's a good guy. He said women love Gordon Brown. I'm just, just making that pint. comment. No, he's a good guy. He's never bought me a pint. He's a pillock. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. What was my highlight? Well, if you're like a Labour spin doctor, then you kind of pick up some of those things. Yeah, yeah, you have yeah. To pick. yeah go on, Stuart. I think my highlight of the week was uh, was uh, the entrance of Brown to the debate, which I do think is going to turn out to be a, a mistake. But who knows? Yeah. Hey, guys, it's been excellent having a wee chat again on the Leith Noise Up show. And uh, look forward to doing something next week. You look like you've got something to say, Phil? Yeah, just a, just, just a wee question, just, just a wee poll here. Who do you think is the most charismatic, oh. Darling or Brown? Darling by a short nose. And ask it? people out there who think about it. Anyway, uh, just in case you're wondering what we're wearing around our necks, uh, oh, it's Guevara, it's Che Guevara. Che, 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 che Guevara bandana. Uh, Mr. Attridge has been holidaying in Cuba and he has, apparently has not come back with any diseases at all, neither tropical nor elderly. No, no, because, uh, well, it's a nice, healthy place. So, yeah, very healthy place. We'll save that. And it has a summer. Oh, right. year. Well, we'll save any anecdotes from Mr. Atridge for another time, I think. Thank you very much to Ed and Dory. Oh, no, Dory's not here. And thanks very much to Phil. Oh, thanks to Alex. And uh, goodbye from me. And, yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.